tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We're all just amazed at how good a job these firefighters are doing. I mean, the fire was very close to our homes. From the air and on the ground, crews battle a wildfire near Lions Bay also. Every year we're kind of ramping up those mitigation strategies. Getting ready for smoky skies, health concerns forcing people to spend big bucks on clean air, and... It's just been so long that he's been in there and it's, it's stressful for him. Making bad dogs worse, questioning a policy that sees dangerous canines locked up. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. We begin tonight along the Sea to Sky Highway where a wildfire is burning. Smoke can be seen from kilometers away. As the CBC's Tina Lovegreen reports, crews are getting the upper hand and the blaze is not expected to grow. The fight continues as crews enter day two of battling this blaze. Firefighters are attacking the flames from the ground and from above. Helicopters have been coming through one after another, dousing the fire with water and the fire is so close to homes that are by the water, about 13 homes that are lying down here. And if the wind had changed direction yesterday and came down, it would have been a much different story. The fire was within 250 or 300 feet of our homes on the other side of the highway. The sound of choppers woke up John Kuzner. This could have gone either way, frankly, right? The fact that they got here quick and with so many, you know, with, with such a heavy duty force has been terrific. More than two dozen firefighters and three helicopters have been working to put out the flames. The work made more challenging by the steep terrain. Their work is obviously to get down into the uh, mineral soil and uh, doing that dislodges rocks. They have to cut trees down and they have to be very concerned about rolling debris. Um, so they can't work uh, one above the other, if you will. The smell of smoke adding to fears. Well, it's been a little hectic. You know, people are a little worried about their boats, a few of them calling and seeing what's going on. Rain is in the forecast for this week, and the hope is it will bring down the fire danger. Right now, the wildfire danger is highest in the coastal fire region. And while we might get some reprieve this week, the long-term forecast isn't favorable. Our long-term uh, precipitation forecasts are, are not showing a lot of rain uh, through the summer. So we are expecting a warmer and drier summer uh, on the coast this, this summer. Which means being more mindful of tinder dry conditions and the devastating consequences a wildfire can have. People just have to be so, so careful nowadays. I mean, you know, the, there's, there's forests right up, to the, right up to where people live, right? It's, it's, it's very scary. The cause of this fire is still under investigation, though it is suspected to be human caused. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, near Lions Bay. Okay, let's go to Brett Sauter home now. Brett, what kind of impact is the weather having on this? Well, for starters, it's a really good thing to mention about the winds. Um, as we just heard, if they had been coming from a different direction, it could have been a completely different story for the residents who live nearby. Now, fortunately, the winds have been light in the area, very um, only about five to seven kilometers an hour. It's actually blowing smoke away. Now, I wanted to show you on the satellite and radar here, there isn't really a lot going on. We've noticed that there really has just been an absence of rain in this region for the past few days, and that's largely why the fire danger rating has been so high. And I did want to show you that one more time just to kind of zoom in on that area anything down to that south coast is of course going to be into that very high to extreme but I do have some good news we did just hear and alluded to the fact that rain is going to be in the forecast and now normally when I've said this before we've only talked about a couple of millimeters and so for the next 48 to say 72 hours there's only going to be trace amounts but if you just notice that huge swath of green go across your screen there that is a sizable amount of rain that is going to be coming for the entire south coast so this gives me a little bit of hope for the days to come of course it's going to be a little dry in the summer of course all right, thanks very much, Brett. We'll see you later in the show. Okay. And with BC anticipating another summer of smoky skies from those wildfires, people are going to extreme lengths to protect the air they breathe. I had the chance to go up to Prince George to take a look at how health concerns are driving hospitals, schools, and even malls to create so-called clean air shelters. It's the old filter. We're going to be replacing it with one of these carbon filters. A nearly $10,000 budget this year spent on making sure the air is clean at Northern BC's largest mall. Replacing all the basic filters with ones that absorb smoke and odor. 
That results from the increasing number of intense wildfires. In the last two years, things have gotten significantly worse. So every year we're kind of ramping up those mitigation strategies to try to manage it. Prince George's central location makes it a hub for evacuees displaced by forest fire. But there is often little reprieve from the smoke. Last August, the city was among the 10 most polluted in the world. It is pitch black again. One day, total darkness at 9 a.m. as thick smoke clouded the air. We saw a drastic spike kind of in, 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 um, in that traffic, you know, so we knew that people were coming here as sort of relief. Health concerns in Western Canada are driving the desire to better filter the air in homes, hospitals, schools and other public spaces. Vancouver is planning to open special clean air shelters for people to find relief. All that has caused air purifier sales at Best Buy in B.C. and Alberta to double in the last year. Home Hardware and Canadian Tire both seeing substantial growth as well. So this is a room air purifier. It does up to 1,500 square feet. Kevin Delahunt with the BGE Filter Shop says the company's manufacturing plant in Edmonton has been struggling to keep up, shipping products out the door as fast as possible. We get a lot of calls on this residentially and we have sold a lot to schools and places that they just want to step up the filtration and on, are unavailable to do it with the existing equipment that they have. But for this BC resident with asthma, one little unit isn't enough. So he's making several of his own. It's just a box fan with a filter taped onto it. Yeah, it's a weird little system, but this is what people are resorting to, right? Resorting to getting creative as smoky skies become the norm in Western Canada's summer months. I need a bath. CBC News, Prince George. Well, he bit a woman at a Vancouver park two years ago and has been locked up ever since. Now the dog's owner and her lawyer are questioning a policy that detains dangerous canines. As Andrea Ross reports tonight, Punky's owner says being isolated for that long isn't helping the dog's behavior. Susan Santos used to play fetch with her dog Punky at this Kitsilano beach. He just loved it. He'd jump in the water and swim right away. I'd have his frisbee here. and. Yeah, this was his beach. <laughs> Instead, the four-year-old Australian cattle dog has been detained at this city of Vancouver shelter okay, since 2017. Punky was deemed a risk to the public and ordered euthanized after biting a woman at a park. Santos appealed the decision and until the court decides his fate, he's here. Not allowed outside, not even for a walk. Santos says the isolation is making Punky's behaviour worse. There's all sorts of things that that could be done better it, it's it's just been so long that he's been in there and it's it's stressful for him dogs that bite people or other animals undergo a behavioral assessment while at the city shelter they are kept here anywhere from 21 days to two years in punky's case really our focus is on public safety okay. and so you know, the, the, the dogs are kept here for, for a reason because of that. And uh, uh, we do our best to maintain the health uh, and the well-being of the dog. Dogs are not trained or rehabilitated while in custody. Santis' lawyer says that's a missed opportunity. And I don't actually think it helps public safety either because some dogs will be released without being trained. And if the owner at the end of the day does not have a court ordered conditional order saying you need to do X, Y, and Z to keep your animal and the public separated, then we have a problem there as well. Santis visits her dog once a week. She trains him through the chain link cell. It's my life now. It's because I see. I see how quick they can learn. And this is not the way to rehabilitate them. Trying her best to turn Punky into a better dog if he's ever released. Andrea Ross, CBC News, Vancouver. He was the backbone of his family and died trying to save his friends. That is how the mother of a 13-year-old boy who was killed by a falling tree on Vancouver Island last week wants her son to be remembered. And I have questions sometimes that why is my son? I try to put that he saves other friends for a purpose. Maybe those friends will achieve something that important in the future. So he's a hero to me.
Ty Caverhill was on a wilderness trip with classmates when the tree came down in strong winds. His mom says Ty spotted it and told his friends to run, but he couldn't save himself. You can read more about Ty's life and the tremendous impact he had on his family and friends on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. LNG Canada is getting a $275 million boost from the federal government. The bulk of the money will go toward buying energy-efficient gas turbines to power the Kitimat plant. A bridge on the road leading to the town's industrial zone will also be replaced. The $40 billion project will see a pipeline carry natural gas from Dawson Creek to the new processing plant in Kitimat. Once there, the gas will be liquefied for overseas exports. There were cheers and jeers as a pride flag was raised at the main entrance of Surrey RCMP headquarters this morning. As the CBC's Deborah Goble reports, a few dozen protesters clashed with LGBTQ supporters. We are they came together under the canopy of the Surrey RCMP detachment, but the two groups couldn't have been farther apart. If you let one person have their flag, you have to let everybody. This is the only flag that will unify this country. But in just moments, the pride flag will also be flown here. We've got a lot of work to do to fight for equality and equal rights for kids like mine and families like ours. A few dozen members of the organization that calls itself Culture Guard start singing the national anthem. While members of the LGBTQ community and its supporters look on with disgust. Canadian welcomes everybody. We're inclusive. And you people have a problem. But the problem, claim the Culture Guard, is a pride flag at an RCMP detachment is a form of entitlement. We are at a hateful pivotal group. point in We're Canada, at a hateful group. Where we have one group that gets special privileges Yeah, we got a hateful rights. group. There was no violence, but this protest and ceremony did get heated and at times chaotic. The truth is that the RCMP belongs to all of us. That's and right, and they're here to neutral. protect the gay and lesbian community but and the transgender. Earlier, Why do you want to stop the RCMP from doing their job? Flag. Our military fought My for freedom of speech for this country, My and you won't Let's get you out of the way. Whether an RCMP detachment chooses to fly the pride flag is a decision made at a community level, and the Surrey detachment chose to do so during Pride Month to reflect the diversity of its employees and the importance of inclusion. Trans rights are human rights. We have every confidence that the RCMP will reconsider what they're doing. Uh -huh. But it did not. Bring forward uh, the flag. The Surrey RCMP raising the pride flag sends a message to clear youth that you don't have to be in isolation and be alone. You are welcome in the community and the police is going to support you. In the end, the ceremony took much less time than the protest. And after everyone had their say, the two sides went their separate ways, while the pride flag waved quietly in the wind above the police station. Deborah Goble, CBC News, Surrey. Fort Moody Mayor Rob Vagramov says he will no longer accept a salary while he fights a charge of sexual assault. Vagramov took a leave of absence three months ago and continued to be paid. In a letter to the city, he now says the case is taking longer than expected and he no longer feels comfortable receiving his full salary, about $110,000 a year. Council will review the matter tomorrow. Vegramov is accused of sexually assaulting a woman in Coquitlam in 2015 when he was a city councillor, a charge Vegramov denies. His next court appearance is scheduled for July 15th. The B.C. Court of Appeal has upheld a lower court ruling that the prolonged or indefinite solitary confinement of inmates violates their charter rights. The decision comes after the federal government's efforts to keep the system across Canada until it enacts a replacement regime. The lawsuit was launched by the B.C. Civil Liberties Association and the John Howard Society of Canada. This decision tells the government that prolonged solitary confinement has no place in Canadian society. The association also argued keeping inmates in solitary for long periods of time deprives them of fundamental protections and leads to suffering and death. Changing your clocks twice a year may soon be a thing of the past. Starting today, the province is asking you to share your views on time through an online survey. 
The options are simple. Either BC continues to change the clocks or it stays in spring forward mode, also known as daylight saving time. Legislatures in California, Oregon and Washington have proposed bills to end the biannual time change. The survey will be open until July 19th. Well, drivers of electric vehicles in the Okanagan and those traveling there now have more places to power up. The province, along with Fortis, B.C., unveiled two new super-fast charging stations today at Kelowna International Airport. In our province, there are three types of charging stations available to drivers. Level 1, known as a trickle charge, is a 120-volt outlet best used when a vehicle is parked overnight. Most electric vehicle owners use a level two, which can fully charge a battery in four to six hours. Uh, but these direct current fast charge stations at the airport can top up the battery to 80% in just 30 minutes. And they're really designed for those long trips. So you can pop in, charge your car quickly uh, on a long trip and carry on again. So you miss the, it takes care of that range anxiety that people talk about. So you get probably three to 400 kilometers on a charge, pop into one of these and off you go again. Drivers will pay $9 for every 30 minutes. Fortis BC will be installing 10 more stations around the Southern Okanagan and the Kootenays later this summer. Well, just a reminder, you can also watch CBC Vancouver News at 6 on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. And if you are watching us right now on Facebook or YouTube, we are also live during the commercial break. After six months in space, a Canadian astronaut is back on Earth. Coming up, how he's making history and where he's expected to touch down. Well, an unusual Finnish <laughs> tradition attracted quite the crowd in Burnaby this weekend. The wife-carrying race headlined the Scandinavian Midsummer Festival. Were you a part of this? No, it was not. <laughs> I see it. The event attracted dozens of competitors, uh, each vying for the weighty grand prize. Our John Hernandez was there. On your mark. <laughs> Get set. Go! It might look confusing, but the rules to this race are pretty simple. Just don't drop your wife. <laughs> it's called the wife carrying race, a Finnish tradition that's picked up steam around the world. It's become the highlight of this annual Scandinavian festival in Burnaby. The wife carrying contest involves two people. Uh, we're very gender diverse, so it can be any mix of a uh, husband and wife. The, uh, the team that uh, does it the fastest without disqualification, wins. The event draws competitors from all different backgrounds. More than 20 teams have signed up here. Some take a minute to size up the competition. Well, there's some fit looking dudes here and uh, some shredded wives, so it's, it's gonna be a dog fight. A 200 meter oval complete with obstacles. And the grand prize? The winning team gets the wife's weight in beer. Such high stakes require strategy. Strategy is uh, legs are going to be around me and pockets. we're just going to okay, give her. <laughs> Hang on for dear life. I try not to crash or kill my wife. Finish Dude. without falling down. Yes, yeah, to not fall. <laughs> that's basically our goal. <laughs> Some teams try the traditional piggyback. Others, the fireman's carry. <laughs> But this seems to be the preferred technique. I think it's been referred to as the Estonian one, where you hold the legs this way and, and the, uh, the wife's uh, head is uh, in the, the gentleman's or whatever butt. There's some tumbles. <laughs> but not for speedsters Courtney James and Devin Pereira. Their 37 second run takes them to the top of the podium and the top of the scale. It's a pretty surreal feeling right now. Yeah, it's very exciting. Whoa! Six cases of beer. To the victors go the spoils. Here, that means bragging rights and more than enough beer to celebrate. John Hernandez, CBC News, Burnaby. I guess it's a good thing they didn't drink the beer before the race. Yes, yeah, probably a good idea. Yeah. That's a good prize, though, and you, it's your wife's weight in beer. And I think one of the rules is whoever the wife is, because they said it can be anybody, has to weigh over 100 pounds. You seem to know a lot about this. Well, I was taking notes. Are you sure I you haven't taken notes? Part? Well, if I do, it'll be the Estonian method for certain, because <laughs> that looks really comfortable. <laughs> Whatever you say. All right, stay with us. We will be back with the latest on David St. Jacques returning to Earth in just a few minutes.
Now, Canadian astronaut David Saint-Jacques is on his way home after an historic space mission. In just under an hour, he is expected to touch down. And we see the hatch now closed on the Soyuz side. Saint-Jacques and two other astronauts, an American and a Russian, boarded a Soyuz spacecraft docked at the International Space Station this afternoon, bringing an end to Saint-Jacques' 205-day stint in space, the longest ever time in orbit by a Canadian. The astronauts will return to Earth tonight, touching down in central Kazakhstan. The CBC's Chris Brown is there with more. Well, we've traveled a very long way to get here. We're almost right in the geographic center of Kazakhstan. And as you can see, a small uh, camp is unfolding behind me. This is the spot where Russia Space Agency believes that David St. Jacques' Soyuz capsule with the three crew members is going to come down uh, at about 10 minutes to 10 uh, Eastern time. Now, it may not come down right here, of course, but there's about 12 or so different spots uh, all around this area, anywhere from as close as just a few hundred meters to about 10 kilometers or so. So what's going to happen at that point is almost a military-like operation will unfold. There are helicopters standing by. There's giant uh, multi-wheeled, multi-tracked uh, vehicles that are going to head out right to where the landing spot is. They're going to set up uh, almost a small medical center uh, with doctors. They even have some blood on hand just in case there's any problems, which they're not expecting. Uh, but it's all, as I say, quite a huge production uh, that Russia's space agency has done many, many times before. They've had over, I think, 140 different Soyuz returns uh, and really no issues with them uh, since the very early days of the program. As far as the re-entry goes, it's going to actually happen once it starts pretty quick. The capsule will only be in the atmosphere for less than an hour or so. Uh, after the de orbit burn, as it's called, it will go through um, the, the, uh, the part of the atmosphere where the outside gets extremely hot, almost up to 2,000 degrees, and then after that, the parachutes uh, will start to deploy first to kind of uh, set its course and then to slow it down. And once it hits about 10 kilometers or so up from here, we'll actually be able to see the parachutes. It's a huge parachute. We'll see it up in the sky. Uh, and at that point, everyone uh, who's involved in this exercise is going to head to that spot. Uh, so it should be a very exciting few hours here uh, in the steppes of Central Asia. Chris Brown, CBC News in Kazakhstan. And Saint-Jacques had a very eventful six months up in space. Yes, in April, he became the first Canadian in 12 years to complete a spacewalk. Here's a look at some of the highlights. I did uh, eventually adjust physically completely. There was also some mental adjustments, psychological adjustments, a uh, sense of disorientation initially, both in time and in space. Learning to fly has been the most important thing, I guess. Learning to you know, move around using your feet and your hands without breaking anything. What is it like up there with uh, people you're working with? You can see behind me they, the banderol of flags of countries that contributed to the International Space Station. And every day on board, we are reminded that we are an example, uh, that every day we work together, every day we prove that when countries decide to put aside their differences, which exist and are true, but when we put aside our differences and focus on what we have in common, we can accomplish amazing things. And one thing you get obvious when you look at the Earth seen from space is that it's just one big spacecraft for all of humanity. And we're all in the same boat, if you want, literally the same space boat, Mother Earth. And so I think it's just a matter of focus. If you focus on the differences, of course, they're there and they can become, you know, overwhelming. But if you focus on what we have in common, uh, that's when you open the door to collaboration and getting further and maybe one day managing to work together and amazing things that we can achieve when we put our strengths together. He has a wonderful sense of fulfillment that he was presented with audacious, near impossible mission objectives, and they accomplished uh, all of them. But bittersweet as well, he's had a tremendous time there. When I uh, feel uh, far from Canada, I have some maple syrup, a little sacred stash here. Go Raptors, go! It's uh, bittersweet, of course, looking forward to going back home, seeing my friends and family, uh, but you know, it's a bit emotional to have to leave station. Well, how are homes, cars, and money seized by the province without a conviction? We'll explain how it all works right after the break.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. The fire was very close to our homes, and they've had, I think, five airplanes, three helicopters, and I believe 50 men up there all day yesterday fighting this fire. Praise from Lions Bay residents for crews battling a wildfire not far from their homes, but the steep terrain is making it harder for firefighters to tackle the flames from the ground. The blaze is about three hectares in size, burning along Highway 99, north of Sunset Beach in West Vancouver. You pick up a box fan and then you pick up a filter and bam, you can put that in your living room. It's a weird little system, but this is what people are resorting to. British Columbians are getting creative in anticipation of another summer of smoky skies from wildfires. Health concerns are driving the sale of air purifiers, doubling at Best Buy Canada in BC and Alberta. The largest mall in Prince George is spending nearly $10,000 on retrofitting its air filtration system. This is not the way to rehabilitate them. He bit a woman at a Vancouver park two years ago and has been locked up right there ever since. Now the dog's owner and her lawyer are questioning a policy that detains dangerous canines. Funky's owner says being isolated for that long isn't helping with the dog's behavior. More than a year after the end of the trial in BC's largest civil forfeiture case, there has still been no judgment. The government wants the forfeiture of three Hells Angels clubhouses, saying they are fundamental tools for the gang's illegal activities. Those houses belong to the Nanaimo, Kelowna and the East End chapters and have all been seized under the Civil Forfeiture Act. To explain what civil forfeiture is, here is Bethany Lindsay. What is civil forfeiture? Back in the early 2000s, the BC government says it didn't have all the tools it needed to fight organized crime. The province wanted a way to cut into gangsters' profits, all those mansions, fancy cars, and stacks of cash. The government could already take things linked to crime as long as the owner was convicted of something. But that means using the criminal justice system. You have to prove that someone's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a very high standard to meet. Civil forfeiture takes things a step further. You don't need a conviction or even criminal charges, just evidence of a connection to crime. 80% of civil forfeiture claims in BC each year are for things worth less than $75,000. These claims go through a fast track process called administrative forfeiture. All the government has to do is mail a notice to the owner. If they don't dispute the claim, they automatically lose the items and there's no need to show evidence to a judge. So what happens to property after it's been forfeited? Some vehicles go to police departments to do community engagement, but most of this stuff is auctioned off online. Some of the money pays for the cost of running the civil forfeiture program. The rest goes to community grants and victim compensation. What are the criticisms? The BC Civil Liberties Association has been against civil forfeiture from the very beginning. They call it an end run around the criminal justice system, saying it eliminates due process and does away with the presumption of innocence. But the province points out that civil forfeiture has survived legal challenges and they say they're acting against property, not people. Bethany Lindsay, CBC News. Well, the provincial government is considering changes to one of BC's most popular tourist attractions. The Royal BC Museum is in a 50-year-old building that's too small and seismically unsafe for its collections. But as Justin McElroy reports, the government's consultations also focus on what a modern museum could look like. Out of Victoria Harbour in Canada. It's home to submarines and the woolly mammoth, totem poles and dioramas. A trip to the Royal Museum is stepping back in time in many ways, including the building itself. Most museums have permanent galleries for 10, sometimes 20 years at a push. These are 52 years old. This month, the province held public meetings about its promise to modernize the museum. It's needed for infrastructure reasons, but museum leaders know any change will be a tricky balance. It's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. People are very nostalgic uh, and very strong feelings about the museum. They're very attached to what's here. So with any moving forward, we have to respect that. 
if you've spent any time in this museum as an adult or a kid, you remember so many of these famous exhibits, but yet so many of them focus on one particular part of BC's history, when Europeans came here in the 19th century, and so much of what they did back then. In our living languages, which is a strong inter recent in intervention of the way we want to present um, our past, um, and that's been inserted into a, you know, galleries that primarily are white male settler history, and that's how it's constructed, and we want to see that change. The museum has an internationally recognized repatriation program for indigenous artifacts, but First Nations rarely are seen in the Becoming BC exhibit, and non-European communities are usually relegated to a footnote. And you can only do that understanding your identity where you are by understanding and coming to terms with your past. The province will be making recommendations in the fall, but is so far not hinting at what may or may not happen. The Royal BC Museum is a, a jewel for the province and, and for every member of British Columbia. This is our shared history. And so a modernization will give us a chance to, to highlight that shared history together. What that shared history highlights in the future might look different than today, because institutions devoted to the past can't be stuck in them. Justin McElroy, CBC News, Victoria. What a beautiful live shot of Vancouver and off in the distance, Burnaby. A week dominated by seasonal temperatures, which isn't necessarily a great thing if you love the sunshine and heat. Brett is here with the full forecast coming up. Brett's here now. Turned out to be a decent evening out there. Not so bad. It took a little while you to did, get here. It did, didn't it? I think there was a lot of cloud this morning. My optimism for the day wasn't particularly great, I'll I, be honest. I don't know if I should admit this, but I turned on the fireplace this morning because I was cold. <laughs> okay, that is a look of pure shock. I, had, I could not <laughs> be paid chilly. to do that. It was chilly. It was chilly. I'll take your word for it. Oh, oh my gosh. All right, well, that said, temperatures are probably not going to be getting a lot warmer, but I'll get into that in a second. Let's take a quick peek at the morning that was. Cloud, cloud, and more cloud. This is kind of what I was referring to. Wasn't super 
optimistic about how it was going to play out, but live outside of our studio right now, the sun has come out and it is nice. It just took it sweet old time to get here for today. But this is going to be one of those things that for the upcoming week, depending on how you like your weather, you're probably going to find something that you're going to love here. So if you like it cloudy, if you like it rainy, there's going to be something here for everyone. I wanted to show you this for all across the South Coast tomorrow. This is probably the most widespread sunshine that we're going to be getting throughout the entire week. So any outdoor plans, by all means, tomorrow is definitely going to be the day to do it. Those temperatures are very close to seasonal. I wanted to show you this look at the radar. Can you see the spiraling mass of cloud just off the coast there? That is going to be our big weather maker over the next three days. And what I've put together here is a map to show you what this will look out like. So this is rain, just in this green blob. This is going to be making its way throughout Tuesday and Wednesday onto the coast of Oregon and the state of Washington. Throughout Wednesday, this is going to then take a sharp northerly track and then almost due southeast, we're going to be getting rain coming all across the lower mainland. And this actually, for once, is sizable. So beforehand, when I've talked about rain, it's just a little bit of showers here and there. But I've been looking at the forecast here, and all of our weather models are in very good agreement that throughout Wednesday, not a lot of rain, but see that huge push. This is anywhere between 20 and 40 millimeters. Now, don't quote me on that value. I do not think it's going to necessarily be that high, but I do like the look of how widespread this is going to be, because as I talked about previously, we of course have our wildfires to be concerned about, and saturating the ground at this time of year is pretty well of the utmost importance. Now, when we look ahead to our five-day forecast for this, what I wanted to show you is that temperatures, as far as we're concerned, is a little bit below seasonal. Normally for Vancouver at this time of year, we'd be dealing with daytime highs of around 20. So anything plus or minus two degrees, that's pretty well close to seasonal. So this is our pretty well mix of sun and cloud day on Tuesday. There's the risk for some showers late into the evening hours. Wednesday, again, just some scattered showers. Notice how I put a 40 pop here. Not a for sure thing, but Thursday and into Friday, that is where we're looking at more of that sizable rain coming. And I think the ground will definitely thank us. All right, thanks very much, Brett. You're welcome. Well, Canada has been eliminated from the Women's World Cup. The team losing to Sweden 1-0 in their first round of 16 match. It's pretty tough to watch. Yeah. The Canadians missed a chance to tie the game from a penalty spot. Team captain Christine St. Clair had one goal in the tournament. She finished the tournament with 182 goals in her career so far, too shy of the world record. If there is a silver lining, it is this. They'll have a chance to rebound at next year's Olympics, where they finished third at the last two tournaments. So Sweden may have won on the pitch, but they did lose out on a bid to host the 2026 Winter Games. The host is... Milano Cortina. <laughs> This will be Italy's third Winter Games and first in 13 years. Sweden has never hosted the Winter Games. The IOC says a deciding factor was the lack of public support there. Well, from leading Canada's NBA team to leading Canada's basketball team, Nick Nurse's summer just got a lot busier. As the Raptors head coach has agreed to lead the men's national team after some convincing from his wife to take the job. You know, my wife and family had to support the, the, the thing as well, and, and um, I was probably at about 65%, and my wife said, 100%, you take that job, so here I am. <laughs> Their first big challenge will be the World Cup. Canada plays uh, on September 1st against Australia. Seven teams will directly qualify for next year's Olympics. Canada has to finish either first or second in the America zone to earn a direct berth. Ramping up the pressure. Coming up, U.S. President Donald Trump announces more sanctions against Iran.
I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. CBC Vancouver's Dan Burrett will host the third annual Canada Day drumming celebration at Creekside Park on July 1st. And don't miss the Indian Summer Festival, July 4th to 14th. This year's provocative lineup features futurists, novelists, stand up comedians, musicians, and storytellers from around the world. For more on these events, check us out online. While the U.N. holds an urgent meeting on increasing tension between the U.S. and Iran, President Donald Trump is cranking up the pressure. As Lindsay Duncombe reports, today he's announced more sanctions specifically targeting Iran's supreme leader. These latest American sanctions are personal, targeting Iran's supreme leader, top military officials, and later this week, even Iran's foreign minister will be sanctioned. Never can Iran have a nuclear weapon. The American strategy is to cripple Iran's economy and bring the Islamic Republic back to the negotiating table. We will continue to increase pressure on Tehran until the regime abandons its dangerous activities and aspirations, including the pursuit of nuclear weapons, increased enrichment of uranium, development of ballistic missiles, engagement in and support for terrorism, fueling of foreign conflicts, and belligerent acts directed against the United States and its allies. Iran has said that it will not negotiate until sanctions are lifted and warned it could shoot down another American drone. We are not uh, ready to receive any intimidation or any threat from nobody. Uh, our interlocutors are aware that Iran is not a country to be to be frightened, to be intimidated. All this as Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was in Saudi Arabia in an effort to build a global coalition against Iran. The sanctions will be welcomed by Gulf allies, but not by Europe. European leaders are concerned the American action will make this worse and are working to de-escalate the situation. When it comes to military action, Donald Trump said today the United States has shown restraint, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen in the future. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. And Trump has given Congress two weeks to come up with a border security package, or else he says his mass deportation raids will go ahead. But as Kim Brunhuber explains, for those people caught in the middle, two more weeks of waiting might just make things harder. A live band, a buffet. The kids may be smiling, but among the parents, the mood is strained. At this fundraiser to support refugees and migrants, there's a good reason many here don't want me to show their faces or reveal their names. Just after Donald Trump was elected president, Carlos and his two children came to the U.S. from El Salvador and applied for asylum. But authorities denied his claim and ordered him deported. Carlos was hoping he'd have time to appeal, but then Trump announced plans to round up migrant families awaiting deportation. For Carlos, going into hiding isn't an option. He shows me his ankle bracelet, which allows immigration agents to track him. Our fear is that they arrest us in the streets, he says, or while we work, or that they come knocking on our front door. Immigration activists say Trump's decision to delay the raids by two weeks is an opportunity. A chance to teach migrants what to do if they get swept up in a raid. We've been collaborating since the announcement um, to do Know Your Rights presentations, um, to go out into the community and, and let our, our members know that they have constitutional rights regardless if they're undocumented. I felt that it was, as, it was much exaggerated. Um, but this human rights lawyer thinks Trump's threat is just empty rhetoric meant to scare migrants and energize his base. Uh, it's really a form of sort of psychological terrorism that, that the administration is using. Uh, knowing it cannot back this up, but knowing that even if it can't, that, that people will still become very fearful. In the meantime, Reverend Fred Morris says he's offering his church a sanctuary. But for migrants who've been in the country for years, it's not easy to leave their jobs and homes. Because if they walk away from that, they lose it all. And that's a pretty high price to pay for short-term protection. The church has no beds. Still, Mora says, a gym floor is much better than a jail cell. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles.
lesbians who want to change their gender. It can be a long surgical journey with few options available in Canada. Now, one Manitoba doctor is trying to help make it easier. But as Austin Gravish reports, he has to go south of the border first. Dr. Blair Peters is packing up his things and leaving Winnipeg. He'll soon be in St. Louis, Missouri, doing a fellowship, learning how to do bottom surgery for transgender patients. I think it's going to be incredibly rewarding, and I hope, you know, everyone realizes how important these procedures are to these individuals. Bottom surgery is the operation that physically changes one's gender. Peters just finished med school at the University of Manitoba. During his residency, he did about 100 top surgeries on patients who were transitioning, augmenting a person's chest or removing breast tissue. But bottom surgery is much more complicated and not done in Manitoba. Instead, patients have to travel to Montreal. You're often away from friends, you're away from family, the travel burden is a lot, um, you're often missing a lot of time off of work. Peters wants to change that, and his motivation is personal. You know, growing up as an LGBT person, I think we all know what it's like to feel like you don't really have a say in things, and it's hard to get your own um, interests and rights heard. The Manitoba government says the number of gender-affirming surgeries has gone up. Over the last two fiscal years alone, over 230 operations were done, and every time a patient needed bottom surgery, they had to leave the province. This here is where they took the donor site is to make the phalloplasty, the phallus out of. Ethan Belcourt had his first bottom surgery done last November. Doctors used skin from his arm for the procedure. Getting to Montreal was tricky for the 49-year-old who lives on a fixed income. But he says the real challenge was coming home to Winnipeg after he had complications. It was hard because you don't have your doctor here who knows the system of what you went through and the full surgery. And his journey is far from over. He still has to have two more bottom surgeries done, but knows it'll be worth it. Being born female, I always felt that I wasn't in the right body. Peters will spend a year in Missouri before moving to Portland where he'll learn for another year, before returning home to Winnipeg where he plans to open a plastic surgery clinic dedicated to trans people. What better way to have a career and make your living, you know, treating and serving your own community? Like, I can't imagine anything more rewarding than that. And he hopes that will make a lasting impact. Austin Grabish, CBC News, Winnipeg. A stem cell transplant can treat more than 80 diseases and disorders, but some ethnic groups are less likely to find a donor. That's because there's not a lot of diversity in the Canada Blood Services System cell registry. The CBC's Taylor Simmons spoke to one fortunate recipient who is now working to change that. You're my hero, man. Thank you. Tom Wong regularly organizes blood drives like this one at his downtown office because he knows the difference donors can make. It's all the the donations from these folks out here who help with all the blood products that I needed why I fought. But a couple years ago, Wong needed a different kind of donation to win his battle. The CBC first spoke to him in 2015, a year after being diagnosed with a rare form of cancer. He needed a stem cell transplant to survive. We're almost looking for your genetic twin. Canada Blood Services says if family members aren't a match, people from the same ethnicity are the next best bet. They share many of the same genes needed for success, but out of the stem cell registry's 450,000 donors, about 70% are Caucasian, about 7% are Asian, less than 1% are black or Aboriginal. What we're finding is that we need to get out and raise more awareness in diverse communities. People are being diagnosed with life-threatening diseases every day, and we need to make sure that their donor is on the registry for them. Wong has taken on that challenge since his diagnosis. He speaks at schools and community events to try and create a more diverse registry. Some of it is just exposure. Some of them is, it is a cultural um, uh, adverse idea, which is pretty much unfounded. Yeah, the main thing is awareness, and that's people don't people think it's really painful to donate, but that's not the case. In the end, Wong couldn't find his own match in Canada, but through an international database, he did find a miracle. It was like a hallelujah moment where um, I found out that my donor um, was actually a woman from Germany, and that was uh, amazing. How crazy is that based on everything that you've heard up until this point? So crazy, um, but, and, but it doesn't, to me, it doesn't negate the need for that diverse mix still because the, the, the stats do say um, that your best chance is within your own ethnicity. 
So healthy now, Wong continues to fight. I'm not going to stop. It's just um, dear to me, and this is uh, whatever weakness this created, it kind of made me stronger. Taylor Simmons, CBC News, Toronto. Into the wild. For the first time, these two marmots are key to reviving a species which was on the verge of extinction just 15 years ago. We'll explain after the break. Well, conservationists on Vancouver Island released two captive-bred marmots into the wild today. These little guys, named Ezekiel and Ernest, are the first of 18 marmots to be released this summer. Fifteen years ago, the Vancouver Island marmot was on the verge of extinction, with only about 30 counted in the wild. Conservationists at the Marmot Recovery Foundation doubled down on their efforts to save the rodent. The foundation reopened its breeding facility last fall. The first litter of pups are now about a month old and they'll be released around this time next year. Conservationists say there are now about 200 marmots in the wild. Well, a dog owner on Vancouver Island is vowing never to let her Yorkshire Terriers off their leashes again. This after one of them swam back to Saanich <laughs> from a nearby island after being lost for three days. Diane Weed says one of her dogs, a five-year-old terrier named Poppy, ran away after it was spooked by a bigger dog while out for a walk in Gyro Park last Monday. Weed alerted Rome, a volunteer organization that helps reunite owners with their lost pets. The next day, a woman spotted Poppy a few kilometers from the beach on nearby Flower Island. Volunteers rowed over but were unable to coax the dog into the boat. Traps were set up, baited with food and water, but Poppy continued to evade capture. Two days later, Poppy showed up on someone's front porch back in Saanich. I didn't even know she swam. The tears were just flowing. I haven't cried like that since I was a child. 
Puppy was examined by a vet following the ordeal. The dog lost a fifth of its body weight, but is otherwise okay. Is amazing. Oh, wow. Look at the little cutie. Quite a ways. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. You can always find our news program online at cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local news is with Dan Burrett right here at 11 after the National. We're going to leave you now with some incredible pictures of nature in action up close and personal. A uh, Rufus hummingbird built her nest in a woman's backyard near Vernon. Of the two eggs laid, only one hatched. The chick has been thriving. It left a nest for the last time this week and is now starting its adventures out in the world. Have a good night. Oh, look at those. Thank you.